The committee did an excellent job in selecting today's speaker. Elder Robert Falkenberg has evangelism in his blood. He is, his parents and his family have been missionaries from the year 1545. Him and his wife's family, if you put it together, they've been Adventist missionaries for 115 years. Anita Emerson, his wife, is she here? Can, can, can you raise your hand or you can stand? Please stand because she is Miami Temple. <laughs> Welcome. She was baptized in Miami Temple, the other church, the first church. So she is Miami Temple. Welcome. Robert Falkenberg has been working in Inter-America for 19 years. He was also, by the way, by the way, él es Boricua. He's Puerto Rican. <laughs> and his wife is Cuban. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Elder Falkenberg was our general conference president for 10 years. And after that, he founded Share Him. And he's been serving as president for 14 years where they have dispatched 13,000 laymen to preach evangelism. He has two children, Robert and Kathleen, and he mentioned to me that his six grandchildren, six grandchildren put together, have, have, have preached 12, 12 evangelistic series already. He calls it heavenly vaccinations. For next year, as the general conference is preparing for the general conference session, Elder Falkenberg has already 250 campaigns planned before the general conference session. Evangelism in his, in his blood. Missionary is in his blood. Sharing Jesus Christ is in his blood. So please welcome our speaker, Miami Temple, Elder Robert Falkenberg. you did not hear is he whispered in my ear. He said, take your time. <laughs> so when I do, blame him. <laughs> my wife and I feel at home. Amen. We were part of the Miami Temple for many years during the time we lived and served at the Inter-American Division office. Lots of wonderful memories in this congregation, in this church, which has metamorphosed just a little bit since then. People are sagging differently than they did then. They've gotten a little more mature, as you would expect of wise people. But I am going to be respectful and I am so thankful I cannot see that clock very well. <laughs> but no excuse, I'm going to put my wristwatch up here where I can protect you from my desire to be more extemporaneous than I should be. Something what? One, two. Am I, can you hear me out there now? Good. I was hearing my fine, myself just fine. <laughs> I want to introduce you to God's problem. His problem was rebellious children who basically said, God, we'll take your opinion under consideration, but we'll decide for ourselves. And the rest of the universe watched, mouths hanging open, waiting for God to start with Lucifer, now Satan, and zap them into, po into powder. Gone. Now you can start over again. All of the unfallen worlds looked over the balcony of space watching Adam and Eve. They had been tested by the tree down the street from their house. 
they did not fall. And then they, aghast, watched Eve reach out and take the forbidden fruit, deciding that her opinion was relevant. There is only one sin, and that is, it seems to me, Eve listened to God say, don't touch it or you will die. She listened to the serpent say, no, you won't. You can be like God. How does she decide? She brings to bear her reasoning. Well, it's good for food. It smells good. It's desirable to make one wise. After all, I'm having a conversation with a fruit-eating serpent. She applies her wisdom to empirical evidence and makes a decision on the basis of her opinion. And so she decides it must be okay. I'm talking to a serpent, and I have never spoken to anyone except God and my husband. And she reaches out and places her opinion above God's word. And God said, I've got a problem. And he comes up with a plan of salvation. And in order for us and the universe to understand the gravity of the situation, he and his fellow members of the Godhead devise a plan. His big problem now is how does he tell the universe about it, not just the people on this planet, but all the rest of the beings who are unfallen because they must see that God is love and that God is just while he is applying this plan here. It's bigger, you see, than our forefathers. He has to satisfy the rest of the universe that he is fair, that he is just, and that he is love. He's got a challenge because we, our forefathers, are uncooperative. He explains it. He demonstrates it at the time of the flood. I'm giving you a choice. Would you rather live well, we'll think about it, we'll debate it, we'll consider it, and we will, we will reach our own conclusions. And they all did, except for Noah's immediate family. And the rest chose to trust the breast stroke. And the rest of the universe noted. And he got to start all over again from one family and their descendants. And he, out of a succession of patriarchs and prophets and followers, he tried through every one of them to explain the plan of salvation, of what was coming, a substitutionary death. Because with rebellion, death is an inevitable consequence. There's no other alternative. God said, I will provide my son. But I, you'll have to, I want to tell you when he's coming. I'll tell you what he's going to look like. I'll tell you what his task is. I'll give you a heads up. And his own people, the ones who had his writings in hand, his own people said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> this, can't, this can't quite be like we're understanding it. And they went through it all, and they could not figure it out. Now, the three college professors, the wise men from distant lands, they could figure out the prophecy. They knew when Jesus was coming. They could figure out what his purpose was as the Son of God. They came following the star that God's people could not see. And yet they found their way to the manger. 
where the Son of God was born. Why? Because God's people were busy following their own interpretations. Deciding that they had more important things to focus on. I'll never forget a story that is painted so tragically clearly. He had come, but he, Jesus, did something. He crossed a line that was unbearable. You see, all the church structure of the time was set up to have its regular annual councils, its meeting of the general conference committee, deal with the routine and the mundane and the practical, that business of running a church, having appropriate programs, having materials and resources and balanced budgets and respected leaders and forming committees, all of those things were running just fine. And the only thing you dare not do is mess up the routine. Because when you mess up the routine, the brethren get upset. Matthew says, Chapter 15, Jesus, you see, was doing his thing. He had gone up away from Jerusalem, how far away from the general conference headquarters, up to that small congregation up by the lake up north, about a, a, long, a long way to walk. He went up there and was teaching and preaching. But he had not secured an authorization and a credential from the appropriate committee. Since he went off on his own, he represented a threat to the status quo. And now that was a problem. You can get away with about anything you want to do as long as you don't mess up the status quo and threaten it. Don't ask those difficult questions. And so those representatives of the brethren went for a walk. They hiked 85 miles in a straight line. Now, nobody could do that because it was very rugged and no trails. If you followed the trails, it was 130 miles to walk for, from Jerusalem to get to Capernaum. And when they got up to Capernaum, sure enough, it was easy to find Jesus. Just follow the smell and the noise of the crowd. And they were all there. No drinking and no bathing no food, there was just a crowd. It's sort of like a giant human magnet brought the people to where he was because he had something to offer. And people come to a place that has something to offer. And when they finally pressed their way, decided to make their way through the crowd to the focal point of attention, Jesus. They had an opportunity to ask the Son of God, the one who spoke the universe into existence, who was sent by God himself to provide salvation to mankind. They finally have a chance to look him in the eye and to ask any question that they thought was important, and they did. They asked him in chapter 15 of Matthew, verses 1 and 2. They came to him and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. That's the best question they can come up with. Anything they could have asked why don't your disciples? They didn't even ask about him. 
But your followers, your disciples, they don't wash their hands there. And the worst part is, is not dirty hands. The worst part is they are not following the traditions of the elders. Now that is a real serious faux pas. Undoubtedly, they watched Jesus for some days before they approached him. They probably caused quite a, quite a stir because everybody else was wearing single-colored robes that were plenty soiled, having no large-volume washing machines. They didn't look good, and they didn't smell good. But the ones who came from Jerusalem, now those guys came with class. They came from Saks Fifth Avenue. They had multicolored garments, which were rather rare, finely woven. And they carried themselves with a certain regal bearing, fell born of a sense of self-righteousness and self-importance. After all, they were sent by a vote of the General Conference Committee in Jerusalem. And they got there... Undoubtedly, it was about the day before when all these people had been following Jesus and they were tired and tuckered out. And the Lord took that little kid's lunch and used it to feed 5,000 people. Now that should have opened their eyes. But what did they see? Who knows? They may have even eaten a little bit of this food that the Lord himself created. Imagine, they gave up attending some of the church organized boards and committees in Jerusalem to come up here. After all, Jesus represented a threat to the status quo, to the organizational structure, to trustworthy management. And then after that feeding, that strange event, to which they frankly paid little mind, they had far more profound questions to ask. They did watch, however, when Jesus got away from the press of the crowd and he had his feet already in the water of the lake. He stepped into the little dinghy with his followers, his disciples, and pushed out where a violent storm overtook them. And fearing they were going to sink, Jesus walks out there to where the boat is with his disciples and he calms the storm and the disciples saw what happened said truly you are the son of God and in the shadow of that rippling effect of that story that ran throughout the thousands of people gathered on the lake shore in two days, huge, two huge miracles. The calming of the storm by the word of the Lord and feeding 5,000 people from five loaves and two fishes. Now they have a chance to ask a question, and this is the best question they come up with. Why do your disciples not Follow the tradition of the elders. You see, they were, they were hung up on the insignificant. Isaiah said in chapter 58, Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter? Isaiah wasn't against fasting, but the fasting should have a purpose. Taking care of the hungry, the ones who needed love and caring. He wasn't against piety that showed, but it needed to be demonstrated giving shelter to the homeless 
Micah said, chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? He has showed you, O man, what is good, and that is to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, Micah was not against generous offerings, but offerings without justice were worthless. So this concept of trivializing truth was not some new problem that Jesus faced. And it's not unusual for us either. Those things can be easily avoided. But it can also make us feel smugly superior to those who are not as holy as we are. The rest of the story probably went like this. After they had this encounter with Jesus, they gathered up their parcels for the road and hiked all the way back to Jerusalem where they sat down that night for a good meal. But before they ate, they were very careful to perform the ritualistic washing of their hands. How did they do that? Very, the instructions are very clear. They took at least the amount of water which could be held in one and a half egg shell. Precisely. Then they poured that water on the tip of their fingers on one palm, holding their fingertips high and letting it run down towards their wrists, lest the dirt flow down and dirty their fingertips. So they held it high so the water would run off their wrist. Then they took the other half and poured it on the other hand. And then they did not dry their hands using cloth. They held their hands high and waited for their hands to dry. And while their hands were drying, they repeated the Shema, the Lord our God is one God. And finally, When their hands were dry, they could be lowered. And then they sat down ready to eat. And while they ate with clean hands, they discussed how they might murder Jesus. It all seemed so perfectly normal, so appropriate. They had defined religion in such a narrow, legalistic way, they could perform their religious ceremonies while living self-centered, self-satisfied lives. Sister White warns us in Desire of Ages, Page 396, whenever the message of truth comes home to souls with a special power, Satan stirs up his agents, who's Satan's agents, to start a dispute over some minor question. Thus, he seeks to attract attention from the real issue. And he's doing the same thing today. After warning us against majoring in minors and the important things, what she adds is the question that most concerns us are, do I believe with saving faith? on the Son of God. And number two, is my life 
in harmony with that divine law. Those are the major items. Let me make it just a little more focused. There is evidence that God has placed before us so we can know if we have been distracted or not. The first one is you will find in 1 John 2, 3. And I don't have time to get into the topic. But let me at least stimulate your curiosity. How many of you believe we are saved by grace through faith? Let me see your hands. Right? Great. We believe that we are not saved because of our obedience. Right? Our obedience does not contribute to our salvation. We are saved by grace through faith. Good. If we are saved by grace, why does God ask us more than 500 times to obey him? Hmm. If I then ask you, I've done it hundreds of times, so I already know what you're going to say. If I ask you, how are you saved, you will say, I'm saved by grace, through faith, praise the Lord. I'll say, amen. How are you lost? Well, if I, you know, if I don't keep the Sabbath, if I eat what I'm unclean foods, if I, in other words, all the bad things. So I'm keeping those commandments does not help me be saved. But if I don't obey, I will be lost. Now, wait a minute. Sabbath keeping does not help you be saved. But if I don't keep the Sabbath, I'll be lost. What kind of psychotic are you? <laughs> so you've got some kind of uh, theological schizophrenia. Why, if you and I are saved by grace, why does God ask us to, be, to obey him? Now there's a problem for you, isn't it? Adventists that do a lousy job of answering that question. Why does God ask us to obey? There's a simple reason. It's a very difficult one to get to unless someone points you down the road. But the reason God asked you and I to obey is to discover if we have accepted him not only as our Savior but as our Lord. You see, Seventh-day Adventists love theological schizophrenia. It's the truth. We love accepting him as our Savior. Oh, man, can we sing anthems about it? But we hate the idea of accepting him as our Lord because we are wedded to our opinions. We think our opinions are relevant. So we want to accept him as our Savior as long as he doesn't ask us to do anything we don't agree with. So the Lord says, Falkenberg, you're saved by grace, but I'm going to ask you to do this and this and this. Why? Here's a text. Write it down and don't mess it up. It's clear. It's, it says, and hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You see, we are not saved because we keep the commandments. On the contrary, it is a gift of God. But if we say, but Lord, it seems to me, I, my opinion is this, who cares? The moment you put your opinion above what God says, you have tried to become your own God. And that is rebellion. So God is God and salvation is by grace through faith. The question is, will you accept him as your Savior and as your Lord? Or are you going to say, yes, Lord, I understand, but that's what, that, that's what you say. But, but about, it makes no difference what the topic is. There are more than 500 directions in Scripture. But the moment you say, but Lord, it seems to me, I want to wear this or eat this or drink this or go there. And I, you know, this seems to me irrelevant. The moment that you say, but it seems to me, it makes no difference what follows. You've just crowned yourself as if you were a little Satan. 
You see, it is not your decision to say whether this is good or bad or ugly or unacceptable, acceptable or unacceptable. Rebellion there only comes in one size, and that's godless type of rebellion. So your message to the world is accept Jesus as your Savior. And the evidence that you have that you accepted him as your Savior is you also accept him as your Lord. And now your question is, Lord, what do you want me to do? You got it. Whatever it is, just give me a hint. I search your word to praise you for un incredible love. But I'm not going to sit there at the tree of knowledge of good and evil and say, but Lord, it looks so nice. It smells good. There's nothing stinky. It's not durian. It's, it still smells good. No dear durian lovers here. Good, smart people came here today. <laughs> In other words, the question we have to ask ourselves is, who is Lord of my life? If he's my Savior, the evidence that he is my Lord it's evidence to me. It's none of your business. You don't have a right to an opinion about me. God already knows, so my obedience is not designed to impress him. He knows. It's for me to discover if I'm playing my own God. And so whether it comes to dress, deportment, finances, liquor, a substitute spouses... Need I speak more clearly? <laughs> the question is, who is God? Is it you in your own life, or is he your Savior and as your Lord? The evidence, the natural evidence of a salvation experience is thrilling. Jude Verses 24 and 25. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. And what does that mean? Simply saying, Lord, but it seems to me that this is, who cares? He's the one who will overcome in your life and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power now and forevermore. You see, the evidence of our salvation experience will be not only saving grace, but victorious living. They're both a gift from him. We are never saved because of what we do. We are saved because of what he did on the cross and what he completes in us. I'm going to read you one text, and I'm going to cut out the last 75% of the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to, I'm going to have to quote it. Romans 10, 9, and 10. 9, I'm just going to quote that one. Paul says, and he, hereby, no, just give me a second, I'm going to read it to you. This is going to step on your toes, and I, forgive me, I intend to. It's no accident. If I could stomp on your little toe with my heel, I would do it. But there's too many of you to do it. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Number two. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
How many of you are interested in that being saved? All of us are. What does he say? Number one, believe. God raised Jesus from the dead. Number two, tell somebody about it. Which of those two is optional? Hmm? Neither one. Both required. You see, most Seventh-day Adventists who attend the temple church on Sabbath, most Seventh-day Adventists believe that personal confession of my faith is optional. It is not my gift. You know, I'm too scared. I don't know what to say. Oh, really? Does that sound to you like it's optional? No. What God is really saying to you is if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you can't help yourself, you're going to talk about it. If you're not talking about it, it's proof to you you don't believe. Are you interested in being saved? Open your mouth and act like it. Pray for somebody. Go talk to them. Go out of your way. No excuses. No exceptions. It's not optional. Now you know why I'm in, in, moved to set up and establish Share Him. Because every Christian who is saved is one who's in the day of judgment. God's going to be able to say, oh, when was the last time you talked to someone else about Jesus? If you can't, wit can't remember when you ever did it, you won't be there. Because you become a witness against yourself by your silence. Your silence condemns you. And as if that test, that text is insufficient, go back to the book of Matthew, chapter 10. If it wasn't clear enough coming from the Holy Spirit through the pen of Paul, maybe you will believe it better when it comes from the mouth of Jesus. He says, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, this is verse 32, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. And he also says in verse 33, however, whoever denies me, that is to say, fails to confess me. You choose not to open your mouth. Whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Would you like to have Jesus stand up for you on the day of judgment? My friends, it's non-negotiable. It's not optional. The dominant task for the Miami Temple Church is not to have glorious music. That's an additional blessing. It is not to have a rich, multicultural environment, which you do. It's extraordinary here today. I'm so thankful you invited me. But that is not the... Pre you see, the, where multiculturalism receives its ultimate approval is not here, it's there. When from every kingdom on this earth, the saints will gather before the throne of God. We exist here to do and talk about what we do. What we do is talk about Jesus, and we come here to talk about what we did. And if we are not talking here about what we did, it's proof that we didn't do anything. How come you're not talking about it? Ah, because you didn't do anything. Guess what? This becomes a celebration of the lost unless we are confessing Jesus to somebody else. This, I don't care about being here. I want to be there. And here, I want to celebrate there. And there, I want to remember what we talked about here. And that's confessing Jesus to somebody else. You see how serious this becomes? When we understand that which is optional and that which is non-negotiable, and it's letting Jesus bubble out, come oozing out. You, this, the Sabbath school classes will be filled with everybody raising their hands, saying, you never guessed what happened to me last week, who I ran into, remember what we talked about. I gave out this. 
The stories will come and flavor the entire atmosphere of the Miami Temple Church when we finally understand the non-negotiability of Romans 10 and Matthew 10. My friends, this has been a joy and an inspiration like I can't tell you. But I want you to know that I pray that I get a phone call one of these days from your new pastor who has already gone on multiple Share Him campaigns with us from over the years past. I hope he will organize multiple groups from here to go oh, and do international campaigns so you get over the fear. And when you come home, by the time you get back home, you will have already planned what you're doing here. And God will help you look like a church that is, the top of it looks like, a, looks like a bubbling mushroom. The top is bigger than the sides because it's oozing. People trying to crowd in and they're just squeezing out the top. In other words, we gather here because of where we're going. And we bring people here to help them find the way. But every one of us carries a flashlight to show them the way. Father in heaven, what an incredible message you have given us. What a joy it is to sing praises to your name because you are the one who gives us power, who gives us courage, who puts words into our mouth. And all we do, Lord, is simply ask you, is it him? Is it her? Where do you want me to go? And he'll guide you, and he'll make sure that you accomplish his will. You just become a tool in his hands. Father, hasten that glorious day when the only thing we talk about here is the evidence of you using us here in order that others will be there, and you have to print a new street plan for the kingdom. Thank you, Father, for your power and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.